Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 96, The American Trip, the U-2, and the Shoe. Last episode, we recounted the beginning of the Berlin Crisis and the planning stages of the grandest moment of Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev's career as leader of the Soviet Union, the American Trip. So maybe I got a little bit ahead of myself once again when I said I'd cover the Cuban Missile Crisis this podcast. Well, researching things, I came across so much material about Khrushchev's American trip, the U-2 incident, Berlin, and the shoe banging at the UN, I just couldn't get into Cuba yet. That, and I don't want to start Brezhnev's ascension to power before episode 100. Which reminds me to keep asking for all of you to continue sending questions you'd like to have answered about Russian history for that episode. You can go to our Facebook page at Russian Rulers History Podcast or to the podcast site itself at russianrulers.podhoster.com. I've gotten some fantastic and some controversial questions already, so keep it up. So, where were we? Ah, yes. Khrushchev had just arrived at Andrews Air Force Base just outside of Washington, D.C. on his Tupolev 114, where he was met with great fanfare. If, at this point, you had only read Pravda, the official Ru Russian newspaper, you would have thought that all of the citizens of Washington, D.C. lined the 15-mile route to the Premier's Hotel. They said, such a sea of people had not been seen in the streets of the city since the end of World War II. Millions of Americans know and believe that the leader of the great Soviet power came here with an open heart and the noblest intentions. In his memoirs, though, he tells a different story, one that has a lot more truth to it with a Soviet propaganda twist. He claimed that the Americans had sent a car ahead of his motorcade with a sign that read, No applause, no welcome to Khrushchev. Some actually believe that the Russians had actually set it up themselves to embarrass Eisenhower. Whatever the deal, the reality was, America was a hostile place for the Soviet leader, and it was about to get hotter. Khrushchev had an inner inferiority complex, set up by years of abuse from Stalin. Much like a child abused by his parents, he was unsure of how he would hold up under the spotlight for the 13-day trip. He was, as Ajubai put it, afraid that he wouldn't be able to handle all the many spoons, forks, and other utensils arrayed in front and beside his plate. His aides prepared him as best as they could on American pluralism, telling him, any hostility that he encountered was the work of a minority, and that the majority of Americans sympathized with him. When he was presented with a lot of critical questions during the trip, Troyanowski remembered that Khrushchev felt this wasn't proper. After all, he was a head of state, and it wasn't right for people to start rebutting him, whether before or after he spoke. This sort of thing got him really angry. This was perhaps another case of his inferiority complex acting up when he felt that not only he, but the country he represented was being insulted. At the National Press Club, Khrushchev gave a positive speech in which he, re he prepared them for his potential gaffes when he said, If I should happen to make a slip, ask me to repeat what I said, because I don't want misunderstood words to clash with what I meant to say and what I strive for. But immediately, the U.S. press went after him, asking questions about his role in Stalin's purges in the ensuing terror. Khrushchev was angry, and his face turned red. You apparently want to place me in an embarrassing position and are laughing beforehand. The Russians say... He who laughs last, laughs best. I will only add that a lie, however long its legs, can never keep pace with the truth. Then they threw a famous comment he made in November of 1956 at a Polish embassy reception where he pointed at the Western diplomats and said, 
Whether you like it or not, history is on our side. We will bury you. The Americans took him literally and viewed it as a physical challenge. He had meant it as an economic challenge that he believed that the Soviet system would eventually be proven superior to capitalism. Another issue brought up to infuriate the Soviet leader was the Soviet intervention in Hungary, which crushed their revolution. As Khrushchev put it, the so-called Hungarian question has stuck like a dead rat in the throat of some people. They are disgusted with it, yet cannot spit it out. Once again, Nikita dodged the recent ugly truths of Soviet history. Next stop was New York City, where he and his family stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. The morning he arrived, he was shuttled to the Hotel Commodore, where he dined with 1,600 civic leaders. In the afternoon, he went to Ambassador Averill Harriman's house on East 81st Street to meet with some of the top capitalists of the U.S., like John J. McCloy, John D. Rockefeller III, Dean Rusk, David Sarnoff, and John Kenneth Galbraith. As Khrushchev put the meetings and the people there, it, quote, looked like typical capitalists right out of the posters painted during our Civil War. Only they didn't have the pig's snouts our artists always gave them. Instead of making us sit at a table in an assigned place, Harriman had us moving around freely, talking to people we were interested in. People kept coming up to me to exchange a few words, obviously trying to sound me out and see what kind of man I was. The meeting didn't last long, as Khrushchev seemed out of place, and he couldn't lecture this group on the superiority of the communist way. My parents remembered this time well and told me a lot about it, as the meeting and most of his time in New York was just a few miles from where I grew up in Manhattan. I, of course, have no recollection of this, but I was only one year old in 1959. His next meeting was at the Economic Club of New York, where 2,000 people attended. Khrushchev was greeted by more heckling and tough questions and how the Premier's notion of peaceful coexistence jived with the Soviet belief of their inevitable triumph of communism. As Nikita remembered his response, they were acting like a bunch of tomcats on a fence. If you don't want to listen, all right, I'm an old sparrow, and you cannot muddle me with your cries. If there is no desire to listen to me, I can go. I did not come to the USA to beg. I represent the great Soviet state. Next up was a long flight to Los Angeles. He lunched at 20th Century Fox's studios, Café de Paris. Kirk Douglas, Frank Sinatra, Gary Cooper, Elizabeth Taylor, and Marilyn Monroe attended. Future U.S. President Ronald Reagan, though, boycotted the lunch. Spiros Skouros, a Greek-born movie mogul, gave a speech about his rise to the top of the capitalist world from very poor beginnings. In a word, his speech followed the same plan concocted by someone else and somewhere else, to out-argue Khrushchev at all costs. Khrushchev responded with his own story to try to top score us. I began working when I learned to walk. Till the age of 15, I tended calves, then sheep, and then the landlord's cows. Then I worked at a factory owned by Germans and later in coal pits owned by Frenchmen. Now, I am prime minister of the great Soviet state. We knew that, someone shouted. What if you did? I'm not ashamed of my past. Walt Disney refused to allow the premier entry into Disneyland as he was a staunch anti-communist, which really disappointed Khrushchev greatly. At Fox Soundstage 8, Nikita and his wife Nina watched Frank Sinatra, Shirley MacLaine, and Maurice Chevalier film a scene from the movie Can Can. When the photographers asked the female line dancers to lift their skirts, Khrushchev derided them by saying, <laughs> 
and the Soviet Union, we're in the habit of admiring the faces of the actors rather than their backsides. While riding around Los Angeles, a sign on the side of the road held by a woman wrote, Death to Khrushchev, the butcher of Hungary. To which Nikita said, If Eisenhower wanted to have me insulted, why did he invite me to come to the United States in the first place? When he was informed that the president had no control over what the American people said, Khrushchev responded by saying, In the Soviet Union, she wouldn't be there unless I had given the order. This was a profound statement about the type of society that existed in the USSR. Even with Stalin dead, it was still a totalitarian society. The evening gala was to be even worse when Los Angeles Mayor Norris Paulson reminded Nikita of his phrase about burying the U.S. You can't bury us, Mr. Khrushchev, so don't try. If challenged, we shall fight to the death. The first premier was furious and went on a rant that stunned the audience. When alone with his entourage, his son remembered he didn't stint on colorful phrases. At times, his voice rose to a scream. His fury seemed to have no limits. From there, he headed to San Francisco by train, which was put together by Ambassador Lodge to try to defuse the situation. We decided to manage the trip as if you were a presidential candidate, Lodge told Khrushchev. As Nikita recalled after stops in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo, when he kissed babies, bowed to ladies, pinned hammer and sickle pins on men, and beamed as large crowds applauded him. The plain people of America like me. It's just those bastards around Eisenhower that don't. San Francisco Mayor George Christopher was far more congenial in his greeting to Khrushchev as opposed to Los Angeles Mayor Paulson. He got a tour of an IBM plant in San Jose, where he began to loosen up a bit. His next event wasn't as pleasant as it was a meeting with United Auto Workers President Walter Ruther and other labor union leaders. When Khrushchev accused the U.S. of exploiting other countries and Ruther accused the Soviets of exploiting East Germans, Ruther responded by saying, Do you have credentials to speak for the workers of the world? Nikita responded, do you have credentials to poke your nose in East Germany? How can you open your mouth like that and represent workers? Things just degraded from there. After his West Coast swing, Khrushchev headed to Iowa to visit Roswell Garst's farm. It was a time where Nikita was in his own element, with farmers, the regular people, which is where he felt comfortable. Garst hosted the premiere on his farm in Coon Rapids, Iowa, on September 23, 1959. The man was already doing business with the Soviet Union, selling hybrid seed to the communist government beginning in 1955, and he tried to play a role in improving U.S.-Soviet communication. After a brief visit to Pittsburgh, both Eisenhower and Khrushchev got together at Camp David to meet about the issue of Germany. The meeting started well, but over time it became apparent that a general consensus on resolving the Berlin issue was not forthcoming. After two days of bickering, they finally resolved that the U.S. was, quote, not trying to perp perpetuate the situation in Berlin, while Mr. Khrushchev had agreed not to force the Western powers out of Berlin. After 13 days in America, not much in the way of solid agreements were reached except that a summit in Paris was to be held the following spring and that Eisenhower would go to Moscow the next summer. But all that would change early in 1960. When Khrushchev returned to Moscow, the entire Communist Party apparat seemed to have greeted him along with all the members of the Presidium. Nikita gave a rousing speech to the public at the local sports stadium. Expectations of the relief of tensions during the Cold War were great, too great to match with the reality of the situation. It was to be another reason for Khrushchev's eventual ouster. As his son Sergei recalled, all his hopes were now linked with the upcoming summit 
and even more with President Eisenhower's visit to the Soviet Union. It was particularly important not to stumble at the start of the process when everyone's nerves were on edge. Once one false move, one wrongly understood step, and all his labors would go up in smoke. That one false move occurred on May 1, 1960. The U-2 missions to spy over Soviet airspace was going on since July 4, 1956, but other missions using different plans had started as early as 1946. The problems the Russians faced was they had no way of intercepting or shooting down these very high-flying planes. Khrushchev believed also there was no way that Eisenhower authorized the flights. But that was not only true, but additional flights had already been approved. Francis Gary Power took off in his U-2 spy plane from Pakistan, heading first over the missile base Antayura Tam, next to Sverdlovsk, Plestek, and eventually returning to Bodo, Norway. Except this time, the Soviets got lucky, and the plane was hit by debris from an exploding missile. Powers, surprisingly, and something that the CIA had not thought could be possible, landed safely on a state farm and was quickly seized by the KGB. Now, when I say landed, parachute. Plane didn't. It was broken up and crashed. Khrushchev was told of the capture during the May Day Parade on top of Lenin's mausoleum in Red Square. He was elated at the news given to him by Marshal Sergei Biryuzov. While Nikita thought it was a great moment, it would be, be the beginning of the end for his rule, as he had been downsizing the military, and now his opponents would begin to seize on that issue. As Khrushchev remembered things in 1969, when asked why he had fallen from power, quote, Things were going well until one thing happened. From the time Gary Powers was shot down in the U-2 over the Soviet Union, I was no longer in full control. Those who felt that American had imperial, imperialistic intentions and that military strength was the most important thing had the evidence they needed and when the U-2 incident occurred, I no longer had the ability to overcome the feeling. As Taubman puts it in his biography of Khrushchev, not the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but revealing nonetheless. Because of the troop reduction, the military began to talk behind the Premier's back, with members of the Presidium beginning to grumble. Brezhnev questioned the move, which was quite brave, as the Presidium members were still scared of Khrushchev. At a meeting of 1,300 members of the Supreme Soviet on May 5, 1960, Khrushchev revealed that the U-2 plane had been shot down, but didn't reveal that Gary Powers was still alive. Still, Deputy Foreign Minister Jakob Malik made a tremendous gaffe that evening in front of the Swedish ambassador and near the U.S. ambassador Llewellyn Thompson by admitting they were still interrogating the pilot. Within minutes, Washington was told. Unfortunately, they had already put out a press release from NASA that said that the plane was a research plane studying high-altitude meteorological conditions over Turkey. One lion cover-up after another came from Washington, trying to muddle up the issue. Then, despite warnings from Ambassador Thompson, Eisenhower publicly admitted that he had authorized the flights. Khrushchev was beside himself and never forgave the president. As Khrushchev put it, Eisenhower's stand canceled any opportunity for us to get him out of the ticklish situation he was in. It was no longer possible for us to spare the president. He had, so to speak, offered us his back end, and we obliged him by kicking it as hard as we could. Members of the Presidium urged Nikita to cancel the Paris summit, and he weighed the options, but he decided to head out to the City of Lights anyway, but he was going to make the meeting collapse. This is a real pity, but we have no choice. The U-2 flights are not only a flagrant violation of international law, they are a gross insult to the Soviet Union. This is how Khrushchev saw it. <laughs> 
the four powers got together at the Elysee Palace on May 16th. De Gaulle and Macmillan shook hands with Khrushchev, but Eisenhower and Nikita did not. When de Gaulle asked if Eisenhower would like to speak first, Khrushchev objected and proceeded to talk for the next 45 minutes from a prepared speech that tore into the U.S. president. Eisenhower was furious, and his red face and neck proved it. As Khrushchev remembered it, I was all worked up, feeling combative and exhilarated. As my kind of simple folk would say, I was spoiling for a fight. I had caused quite a commotion, especially with the passage in which we warned we would rescind our invitation to Eisenhower if we didn't receive satisfaction from the other side. The Soviet premier proposed a delay in the meeting, at which point he and de Gaulle got into it. Before you left Moscow and after the U-2 was shot down, I sent my ambassador that this conference should be held and that it would be fruitful. You have brought Mr. Macmillan here from London, General Eisenhower here from the United States, and have put me to serious inconvenience to organize and attend a meeting which your intransience will make impossible. Also, yesterday... That satellite you lost just before you left Moscow to impress us overflew the sky of France 18 times without my permission. How do I know that you do not have cameras aboard which are taking pictures of my country? As God sees me, my hands are clear, responded Khrushchev. Well then, how did you take those pictures of the far side of the moon which you showed us with justifiable pride? And that one I had cameras. Ah, and that one you had cameras. Eisenhower announced that future flights would be suspended, which gave Khrushchev a minor victory. The meeting was adjourned, much to the consternation of all involved, except the Soviet leader. Towards the end of his visit to France, Nikita had a press conference in which he ranted for over two hours amid catcalls and shouts. The Presidium began to grumble about Khrushchev's uneven behavior and the fact that nothing came out of his attempts to push for peace with the West. The Chinese were thrilled with the breakdown, but not for long. At a Congress of the Romanian Communist Party on June 20, 1960, Khrushchev went into an anti-Chinese diatribe. He accused Mao of being oblivious of any interests other than his own, spinning theories detached from the realities of the modern world. He also accused him of being a scumbag. Not a great way to make friends and influence people. From there, he cut up numerous contracts with China and withdrew over 1,000 Soviet experts from his communist brethren's country. Now I get to mention the name of a future premier that we'll do a podcast on. And it is Yuri Andropov who had warned that this was a big mistake, but he was ignored. As Lev Dolushin, who worked with Andropov, recalled, We got a call from Khrushchev's secretariat saying that he had just signed an order withdrawing them. I consider this one of Khrushchev's most flagrant mistakes. Of course it led to a further worsening of relations. He thought it would improve them. Next up on Khrushchev's schedule, was another trip to the United States, but this time not to meet with the American leaders, but the world leaders at the United Nations in New York. Instead of traveling by plane, Nikita decided to take a ship across the Atlantic, where he was given reports on world affairs from a team of advisors and assistants. When he got to New York, the Longshoremen's Union met him with signs like, Roses are red, violets are blue, Stalin dropped dead, how about you? Not only that, but the Union would not help unload the ship, which meant that the Soviet contingent had to carry their own bags off the boat. At the United Nations, Khrushchev was at his worst, lecturing fellow delegates and behaving bizarrely. As Taubman put it, Khrushchev's behavior in New York was not just extravagant and erratic, it was bizarre. He pounded the top of his desk with his fist, to protest a General Assembly speech by Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld, 
and continued doing so until joined, after some hesitation, by Gromyko, other members of the Soviet delegation, and finally all other communist delegations. When British Prime Minister Macmillan publicly regretted the failure of the Paris summit, Khrushchev leaped to his feet to shout, You sent your planes over our territory. You are guilty of aggression. And again started waving his arms and pounding his fists on the table. Macmillan complained over his shoulder to the presiding Assembly President, Frederick Boland of Ireland, that if Khrushchev continued in the same vein, he would like a translation. Boland gaveled Khrushchev to order, and that day, at least, the Soviet Union leader refrained from further interruption. On the last day of the trip to New York is when Khrushchev famously pounded his shoe on the desk after a Philippine delegate said that Eastern Europe had been deprived of political and civil rights and had been swallowed by the Soviet Union. This type of behavior was to be thrown back at Khrushchev in 1964 when he was ousted from power. Few in the audience that day thought the Prime Minister's performance was anything to write home about. The Soviet Premier was pleased with the shoe banging, but none of his colleagues were. Next time, we will definitely go over the Cuban Missile Crisis and Khrushchev's relationship with the new American President, John F. Kennedy. But it won't be this week, as I need to take a little bit of a break to take care of family and business matters. But I will be back in two weeks with episode 97. And I'll be doing another overdrive uh, reading from uh, Khrushchev's memoirs on the issues with China. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes so I can move up the history podcast list. Also, don't forget to join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Group, where you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a comment. So, as always, das vidanya i spasibo bolshoya.